All right. Well, welcome to everybody who came to um, be with us tonight for our first uh, book club author speakers uh, series of the new year for 2021. Um, we're very excited about this uh, presentation tonight because uh, we have a young woman, Carrie Green, who has written uh, uh, Studies of Familiar Birds and it is a book of poetry. And some of her inspiration came from one of our authors that we had early on. In fact, I believe she was our first of our book club series, and that is Joy Kaiser, who wrote uh, The Birds and Nests. The Nests and Eggs of Ohio Birds, um, and the other Audubon, it, it was based on, her other Audubon was based on the Nests and Eggs of Ohio Birds. So um, the two of them together are going to give, we're not getting one presentation tonight, we are getting two presentations, and then we are hoping uh, that we will have time for some uh <clears throat> some questions and answers after we are finished. And Joy, since she is the lady who wrote the uh, book about uh, the other Audubon, a very, very interesting uh, book, and she has agreed to later on in our series for 2021 to uh, give us a Recap of that once again, so that'll be very interesting. Um, Joy, without further ado, I'm going to let you start with your presentation. I think Betsy and you have it set up, and we are ready to go. Oh, one minute, Betsy says. Or something like that. Oh, oh, this is great. Next week is our... Uh, favorite book series that we ask people to come and share their favorite books about nature. And I understand from that both of our authors, Carrie Green and Joy Kaiser, have agreed to uh, be with us next week. So won't that be fun? That's going to be really a fun time. Okay, Joy, I see your first slide up there. So I'm going to mute myself and you are on. Okay, thank you. I'm going to attempt to tell you the story, the backstory that um, inspired my book, America's Other Audubon. My earliest memory is seeing a brown bird fluttering in a tree when my mother was carrying me to the neighbor's apartment in Barberton, Ohio, to play with the little girl next door. And I was about two. And it, before that time, I had no idea that there were wild animals living outside. It was just fascinating to me. And we lived above my father's television repair store until I was six. And then he bought a house in the country with two acres. And it was like my world had gone from black and white to color because there were birds of every color in the trees. And they were singing at night and in the morning. And in the backyard, there, was an, there were these tall trees in the front yard that I wasn't allowed to climb. And then there, were, there was an orchard in the back that was all trimmed closer to the ground. And so I quickly learned that I could climb up into the trees, and I found birds' nests there. And most of the time, I just found sparrows' nests with the brown-spotted, white and brown-spotted eggs. But every once in a while, I'd find a robin's nest with those beautiful blue eggs. And I'd watch, climb into the trees every day and watch those birds as they became, got their feathers and when they learned how to fly. But there was one nest that I never got to see, and that was an Oreo's nest that was in the front yard. It was one of those trees that I wasn't allowed to climb, and it was so high that I used to lay on the grass with my head back so my neck didn't get tired so I could watch those birds flitting back and forth. And I had a general idea what the nest look, looked like because I had this little 
field guide to birds that I bought for a dollar and twenty-five cents, and it had a picture of an Oreo's nest. But you can see, it doesn't really tell you anything about what the nest is made of. It's just more of a generalization. And so many, many years later, in May of 1995, when I walked into my first day of work at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History as their librarian, I was stopped dead in my tracks by the sight of an illustration of a book in a book that was propped open outside the library. And there was this depiction of an Oreo's nest that was so realistic it took my breath away. And I was not only fascinated by the intricate construction of the bird, but by the skills of the artist. I found out that there was a little label in the case that said that this book had been started by Genevieve Jones. She had the idea, and she and a childhood friend started creating the illustrations in 1879. And then the label said, after she died, her, her mother took over the artwork to complete it, her brother collected the nests and eggs, and her father paid the publication costs, and they spent seven years of their own lives completing the book. And I just became fascinated with that idea. And every day there were these pictures of the family inside the exhibit case, and there was just something haunting, I thought, about Genevieve's face. I just wanted to know what kind of a person inspires her family to spend so much of their own time and energy finishing her dream and what kind of people were they? And so I started just doing research and uncovered this story. The father, the man who would be Genevieve's father, Nelson Edwards Jones, was born on September 20th of 1821 to Quaker parents in Ross County, Ohio. And they lived in a log cabin that they'd built with their own ha hands on a farm called Fruit Hill. Nelson had been a sickly child and came close to death before, but he, he was inspired by the doctors that helped him get well, and he decided he wanted to be a doctor himself. So he got a late start. He was already 21 when he went to Augusta College in Kentucky. He had to come back home in, no, in a short order because he was so sick, but he finally recovered. This was his, the, the cabin that he was born in. Sorry about that. Things were a little out of order. He finally recovered and was able to go to Cleveland Medical School in 1845. It was a two-day journey by boat and a three-day stagecoach trip to reach Cleveland, Ohio. The school had been established by Dr. Jared Potter Kirtland, who conducted the first survey of Ohio birds and along with mammals, fishes, and mollusks in 1837. Nelson thrived under Kirtland's guidance, but it wasn't only in the classroom. He benefited by Dr. Kirtland's willingness to teach him about natural history after hours for free. And while Nelson was going to Cleveland College, he met Dr. Hamilton Lanfear Smith, who was a Cleveland scientist and a Yale graduate who was deeply entrenched in the Cleveland scientific community. Hamilton and Nelson became best friends, and they associated with members of Cleveland's first scientific society, the Archites, a group of scholarly men who, built, who met in a two-room building to study their growing collection of animal specimens. No kitty. <laughs> the building was nicknamed the Ark because one new member had remarked, that he thought he had just entered Noah's Ark because there were two of every kind. And the members of the society were called the Archites. Nelson thrived on his friendship with Hamilton Smith, that it did a lot more than just satisfy his eager mind. At a party one evening, his eyes came to rest on the face of 18-year-old Virginia, Hamilton's youngest sister. And it was love at first sight. Fortunately for Nelson, Virginia felt the same way. After he graduated in spring of 1845, they became engaged. And they finally married in June of 1846 and moved in with Virginia's parents in Cleveland. Their daughter Genevieve was born May 13th in 1847. 
Her family and friends always called her Jenny. She was joyful and energetic and inquisitive, and from the beginning it was obvious she preferred to be outdoors. When she was just a toddler, Nelson commissioned a miniature set of hoe, shovel, and rake so she could work outside with the gardener because she loved to be outdoors. Jenny's younger brother was born six years later, August 24, 1853, and that was the same year Nelson moved his family to Circleville, Ohio to set up his medical practice. Circleville got its name from the shape of the Hopewell earthwork on which it was first built. The streets were arranged in a circular pattern with like spokes on a wheel and an octagon-shaped courthouse was the center of like a hub. Near the Ohio and Erie Canal and surrounded by wetlands, Circleville was a town that could support the work of lots of physicians because the standing water was notorious for causing outbreaks of malaria and typhoid fever. When Jenny was six years old, she began what would be a lifelong pastime, riding with her father in the buggy to visit his patients. And along the way, he taught her everything he had learned from Dr. Kirtland about ornithology. And they, with the help of their little dog, Arcos, who liked to flush birds' nests and birds, they, they observed lots of um, wonderful sights. And on one of these early bug, buggy rides, they found a nest that they couldn't identify. Later they found out it was a nest of a Baltimore Oriole. But Jenny said she wanted to hurry home to her father's library so she could look up who, what bird had built the nest. And that's when she learned no one had ever written the book about American birds. And she said, I can hardly believe no man had thought to create a book so one person could tell one nest from another. Howard showed interest. This is Jenny at a later date. Howard was passionate about na nature and science, too. And as he grew up, and they started to keep talking about how helpful a book would be about nests and eggs, he began volunteering to collect those nests if Jenny wanted to paint them herself. They were both homeschooled, Howard and Jenny, by their mother until there was high school age. And then they went to Everett's High School. Jenny went when she was 14 and graduated in 1865. And at home, her education was continued. She was tutored in French and Greek and German and studied piano. Her Greek tutor, who thought, taught at Miami University, said she was the most gifted student he'd ever had. And her piano teacher stopped accepting money for lessons because she was a better musician than he was. Howard entered Hebert's High School when he was 14 as well. And he described himself as a mediocre and a reluctant student he just wanted to spend all his time roaming the woods. He wasn't interested in going to college, but it was just assumed that someday he'd grow up and have a family and he'd need a vocation. So when he graduated from college, uh, from high school, he went to Hobart College in New York, where Uncle Hamilton was now a professor of astronomy. While he was away at school, Jenny followed his college group curriculum using books from her father's library. And when Howard came home to visit, he said she was better informed in his subject than he was himself. She was approaching 30 and still unmarried. And she had so little in common with her peers, she must have felt isolated and left out. Howard recalled, as I saw it then and remember it now, there seemed to be something lacking in her life that gave me a touch of sadness at times. And I believe her mother and father saw it, but I don't remember that we ever spoke about it. There was, however, one person outside the immediate family whose intellect just seemed to mesh perfectly with Jenny's. He was 10 years her senior, an exceptional musician and literary critic, but unfortunately had one tragic flaw. He was a periodical drinker. Howard said that was common in the years after the Civil War. But Nelson and Virginia objected to the relationship because of the alcohol. They believed alcohol should be used for medicine and not for a drink. So Nelson made a couple promise that they would not marry for a year, during which time 
the suitor would have to stay sober. Unfortunately, we never know his, you don't know his name. It's been lost to history. And unfortunately, he, he couldn't keep sober. And so Nelson felt he had to forgive, forbid them to marry. Genevieve probably told her closest friend, Eliza Schultz, about her broken heart. And she became bitterly dis depressed. So her parents decided to send her away to Pennsylvania, and she probably stayed with Lizzie's relatives. She was supposed to spend some time away to get over her loss. And while she was there, she visited the 1876 Centennial Exhibition. And while there were also an exhibit, some of the original prints from Audubon's Birds of America. And she was reminded that even this master bird artist hadn't included nest and eggs. And when there was a, an occasional nest, it wasn't scientific to the degree that the birds had been. When she came back to Circle Bow, she'd made up her mind she was going to create that book of nests and eggs that they had talked about for so many years. Her father felt so guilty about her still obvious sadness that he relented and let her start the project. People have gathered around to help her. Her friend Eliza offered to help with the drawings. Her brother offered to help gather the nests and eggs. And Jenny and Eliza began practicing drawing nests using a pair of calipers to take precise measurements and a magnifying glass to examine the details of the nest structure. And Nelson began to research how to go about creating a book and publishing it. Nelson, Jenny had wanted to illustrate all the birds in North America which would have been at the time 888, they estimated. But her father talked her into just starting with 130, the birds that nested right there in Circleville. Nelson wrote the perspective. There would be 100 copies. They'd each be, the nests and eggs would be gathered freshly so the colors would be at their peak. And then they'd be drawn life-size the way the birds had been in Audubon's work and hand-colored with imported Windsor Newton watercolors. The book would be sold by subscription and issued in parts. The colored version of a part, which had three illustrations and the text, would cost $5. And the uncolored version would be $2. And once they had 20 subscribers, they started their work. The, their drawings were transferred to those lithographic stones using a pantograph, which is a tool where the work of one pointed one pencil, if I could do it, is duplicated by the point of another, and it makes a perfect copy. Then those stones were crated up and shipped to the printer in Cincinnati to have proofs run. It was 150 miles there. This particular stone weighs 65 pounds and now is preserved in the Ohio Historical Society which is now called the Ohio History Connection. Nelson and Howard, um, their offices were on, by now, Nelson, I forgot to say Howard was a doctor too, their, their offices were in the downstairs of this building, which is now three offices, but at the time the Joneses lived there, it was two, and the, they lived in the roomy part, apartments above, and the drawings were started right in the family dining room. But it quickly became apparent that the house wasn't the right place to do scientific illustration. There wasn't adequate lighting, and all the nests made the living room, dining room, look like a jungle. So um, oh, I'm going to calm down here a minute. So um, Nelson had a studio built and added to the roof of the barn here so that Jenny could have her book production outside. And I think it was a lot like the Ark, where his his college days, he, he created um, a place like the Ark for Jenny to have as her studio. The Joneses had the support of the most, the most. Um, he was notorious. He was also the most eminent um, ornithologist in America, Dr. Elliot Cowes. And they sent Dr. Cowes a copy a sample copy of what they hoped to create in 1878. 
And this is his actual copy. It's still preserved at the University of Kansas. And the first sample included three illustrations. There was the Baltimore Orioles nest, which Eliza drew. The sample copy you can see is very, very lightly colored. You barely have an idea what the end product is going to look like. And then here's a, a sample of the final version. And then the next illustration was the nest of the wood thrush, which Jenny, Jenny painted. Same thing, light colors for the sample, an improvement on the final one. The third illustration was, was the nest of the black-billed cuckoo, drawn by Eliza. This was the only illustration in the book that drew some negative criticism because they objected to the artistic manner that she dangled the eggs by a thread. And after that, they agreed that all the eggs would be illustrated on a line at the bottom of the page in a more scientifically accepted manner. Part one was mailed to the 20 subscribers in July of 1879. And immediately, there were more people signing on to the project. Howard said that even though Genevieve seemed happily preoccupied with her venture, she really never was her former self. After her romantic disappointment, she had grown silent and withdrawn and seemed to have lost much of her zest for living. And on the rare occasion that the former Sooner visited the Joneses, it was still obvious to everyone that they may remain deeply hurt. And then just after part one was issued to rave reviews, Genevieve was sickened by typhoid fever and she lay seriously ill for three weeks. Howard tried to encourage her, telling her that she was getting better, that the fever had passed and she was going to get well, but nothing he could say could convince her. She said something to the effect of, you finish the book, just like I'm here, and Mother will help you. And because it was obvious it was hard for her to talk, Howard told her it was all right to go to sleep. And the next day she developed meningitis and died at the age of 32. Hmm. It won't change. Sorry, just a minute. This was just what I was afraid of. There, that was one too many. Okay, so anyway, the family was immobilized by grief, and no one knew what was going to happen to the book project. Genevieve Souter became so overcome with remorse and sorrow that he eventually committed suicide by taking an overdose of morphine. Howard wrote, he also often spoke to me about Genevieve and lamented her death, and I always felt he felt somewhat to blame. Genevieve had only lived long enough to, keep, to create four illustrations for the book that had been a lifelong dream. The nest of the eastern kingbird, the nest of the indigo bunting, and the nest of the yellow warbler. And this is the last drawing, which the family preserved. So some decision had to be made. And so finally, Jenny's mother, Virginia, who wasn't remotely interested in birds, who had never drawn anything that required scientific accuracy before, decided that she'd help by coloring the Eliza's illustrations and finish the book. Part one could be sent out in time because it had already been completed. And Eliza nip, tipped a note onto the first play, page that let the subscribers know about Genevieve's death and that the book would be continued. Virginia only intended to help with the hand coloring, but when Eliza announced that she wanted to move to New York to go to art school, Virginia ended up taking on the whole project by herself. She had never done anything except to create little gifts for her husband before. And this is a book that she filled with text and watercolor paintings, which she copied from an existing copy of William Cullen Bryant's poem, A Forest Hymn. But you can see that these drawings are not scientific, and they, don't, they aren't exactly precise. They aren't photorealistic. 
the book is about, the poem is about comparing the architecture of a chapel, a cathedral, with the, with the architecture of a forest, God's creation. But you can see that Virginia is not a person that's comfortable in a forest and that her illustrations just kind of skim across the surface of a landscape. They don't make you feel like she really understands the processes that exist there. It wasn't until the time Jenny died that Virginia began to even think about the natural world that had meant so much to her to husband and children because she was going to have to do that if she was going to create drawings as exacting as those that had been created before. Although her first attempts at lithography were tentative, somehow she managed to make her drawing skills as precise as those that had been done earlier and I think the transformation between the quality of the paintings in the forest hymn and this to Virginia's first illustration for his daughter's book is such a tangible example of the transformative power of love but it was just too much for one person to color 100 copies of every illustration so they hired Nellie Jacob one another Circleville girl to help with drawing the patterns on the eggs. And they hired Josephine Clippert, a Columbus artist, to help color the nests. Kate Gephardt was hired to help color less important parts of the composition. Now that there were so many people involved in creating the book, it was costing more to create than they had estimated when they created their subscription cost. But Nelson held out hope that when the book was finished and had established its reputation, he could increase the price for a bound copy. Work proceeded smoothly until 1881, when both Howard and Virginia also came down with typhoid fever on the same day. And they were sick for several weeks. They did recover, but Howard suffered damage to his heart and, Nelson, and Virginia's eyes were permanently weakened. But still they continued their labor. Nelson would draw, or Virginia would draw fresh eggs and nests on the lithographic stones and paint a master template from which others worked. And when Howard was too weak to practice medicine for a year, but he spent some of his better days driving in the countryside to gather nests and eggs. During this time, he was not only juggling a medical career with his part of the book's production, but he was married and raising a large family of his own. The, book, the work on the book was completed in um, 1886. Howard had to travel to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. because he couldn't find all the nests and eggs, either in the field by himself or in other collections of Ohio nat naturalists. One, one bird was left out entirely. That was an eggs and nest of the cerulean warbler because no one in Ohio had those specimens. The book was finished in 1886 and they found Virginia's copy by one of the best binders in Chicago and sent it around as a sample. And it did inspire a few more purchases Howard learned that there was a woman, going to be a women's pavilion in the Columbian World's Fair of 1893, and he persuaded his mother to enter her books in the women's library there. It was awarded a bronze medal. All of the medals were bronze. It wasn't like there was a gold, silver, and bronze. And Jenny's dream for filling a gap in the American ornithology had been accomplished, but the victory was bittersweet. When a librarian who was writing a review for the library journal inquired of Virginia, how did you have the patience to complete it? Virginia responded, I did it in memory of my daughter. she just begun the work when she died. So for her sake, I made it as perfect as possible. The work Jenny initiated and her loving family brought to fruition broke new ground in the field of natural history illustration. 
when members of the American Ornithologist Union gathered on April 20th, 1917, to collectively celebrate the 70th birthdays of members who had been born in 1847. The names of seven individuals were noted who had not lived long enough to reach that milestone, but still left their names indelibly impressed on the records of ornithology. <laughs> Genevieve Estelle Jones was listed among them. Virginia lost her eyesight at the end of her life from the effects of the typhoid fever and the long hours of straining to draw and color the nests. And Nelson lost his entire retirement savings, completing Jenny's book. But neither parent ever complained. They both always said they were just thankful they had the resources to see the project through to its conclusion. And they considered their work on the book the most significant accomplishment of their lives. After Virginia and Nelson died, Howard locked the doors to the workroom in the barn. And they remained sealed for 32 years. All of the grandchildren had grown up hearing about the illustrations of the nests and eggs of the birds of Ohio. And they had a fierce curiosity about that secret workroom. It became too much for Nelson's grandson, grandson Nelson III. He and his friend Sam Chambers, both 12 years old, sawed the hinges off the door to gain entrance to the space. This is uh, Nelson's brother, Lloyd, both Howard's grandchildren. And Nelson told me in 1998, at the time he saw the hinges off the door, the feelings of excitement were intense, but they couldn't begin to compare with the retribution that followed. Grandfather Howard was always deeply sentimental about the years he spent with his family working on the book. Perhaps it was Grandson Nelson's intrusion in the barn that started Howard searching for a place for his mother's copy so it would be preserved. The book and the bronze medal from the World's Fair were purchased by an unknown woman from Cleveland in 1924. They were supposed to be given to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, but they, they never were. Howard never heard, heard the, learned the name of the woman, and the book didn't appear at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History until 40 years later when it was given by a veterinarian from Chesterton, and by then the bronze medal had been lost. Howard um, always believed that one day illustrations of the nests of eggs would be priceless, and his last act after he fell down the stairs at the age of 93 was to have his daughter and secretary prop him up in bed to sign over ownership of the last copy of Nests and Eggs to his daughter, Eleanor. All the medals in the World's Fair, there were 26,000 bronze medals in the World's Fair. I always hoped someday I would find Virginia's medal. I started looking through catalogs that was before the internet. Joy, we lost your mic after you said that was before the internet. I'm so sorry. Joy, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. That was before the internet. I, I looked for, um, I looked for, at sales catalogs to try to find Virginia's medal. And I had an idea what a medal would cost. And then um, eBay developed, and I started looking at medals on eBay and spent years, decades looking. And finally, in, in 2016, I got a royalty check, another royalty check from America's Other Audubon, and there were three medals on eBay. And I, I, bet, I bid on the cheapest one. And when it came, I turned it over to see who won it, and it was a name I recognized. It was um, it was the name of a book dealer 
who Nelson had written to, to sell finished copies of the book. What are the chances? They could have been the books that um, the book dealer won the medal for were within walking distance of the Joneses book. They could have even crossed paths at the fair. And so on August 24, 2016, the librarian and I opened the case and, and put the put the substitute medal in with the pictures of the Jones family. And I just like to think when I did that, that somewhere this family was smiling. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, people. <laughs> Gloria, we cannot you. hear you. You know, I must click twice or something because I always do that. I think I'm on and then I come back off. I think that's a great introduction to Carrie's presentation about her um, book of poetry, Studies of Familiar Birds, where she based some of uh, her uh, poems on these illustrations. So it'll be really interesting to see how she has brought, what, a 19th century, 20, yeah, 19th century book into the 21st century and Joy bridged the gap. That's really, really amazing. Now, I, I believe that Betsy and Carrie needed to do some switching and I'm just wondering if Carrie is now our presenter and that I can turn, oh, I can wait just one minute and then we can turn it over to Carrie so she can carry on with her presentation. This is very, very interesting. I hope everybody can stay with us uh, for the question and answer uh, present part of the um, uh, presentation and um, we want to make sure that Carrie gets just as much time that she needs to give us a really good uh, synopsis or a something that will intrigue us that we want to pick up her book of poetry. So Betsy is giving me the high sign and I'm going to go back on mute and Carrie, it's Okay, um, let's see, I, I kind of lost my view. Are you, are you all able to see my screen, my, my presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, well, um, thank you so much, Joy, for um, for telling us about about the Jones family and about your process of um, discovering them. Um, you know, I could not have um, written my book without your work. Um, and of course, I'm also a librarian, um, so I especially appreciate. Um, all of that um, uh, uncovering of the archives that you've done. Um, and um, in fact, my, um, I found out about your book, America's Other Audubon, from a, from a fellow librarian, from a colleague um, who had read it and thought, hey, you know, I think you might like this. Um, and that's what, um, that's what, led me to um, to read that book and um, I'll, I, as soon as I did I um, felt I knew I wanted to write about them um, I didn't quite know um, you, what angle I was going to take um, you know initially I thought that I would write from the point of view of all of the family um, but, um, I, you know, I think Joy put it really 
well that um, that it was this amazing act of love that Virginia was able to um, to create these illustrations, even though she had no experience um, in scientific illustration. Um, and so I was just pretty pretty early on in the process, I was very much attracted to Virginia's point of view. Um, and also, um, I should say that a lot of the book deals with my father's death. My father died when he was um, 57 of pancreatic cancer. Um, so poems about him, um, his life and his death are intertwined. And I think um, I, trying to understand Virginia and how she worked through her grief and how she created something really beautiful out of her grief, um, I really saw that as a model. Um, so actually the first poem that I wanted to read is not about a plate. Um, it's about the, um, the incident that Joy mentioned um, with um, Nelson's grandson um, discovering the um, studio, unlocking the studio doors for the first time. So I, I don't have a, I, I wish I had um, Joy's wonderful slide on some of those pictures I'd never seen before. So um, it was great to see those as well. The studio. You will find it is not enough to view the room as panorama. The clutter of nests and eggs blurs beneath a shroud of dust and all you do not know names, calls, topography. Not to mention an oriole's wings clipping the air beside your ear or a robin's nest filched moments ago and flush with warm blue eggs. Step inside the room. Unlock cabinets and open drawers to reveal the ordered clutches of eggs thumb or palm-sized, brown as a common hen's, or creamy and swirled like marbles, blown out, insides washed clean. Unstack the nests from shelves. The newspaper packed within crumbles at your touch. Note the yellowed down of willows the brittle grasses and weeds, and in between, the long gray hair and black thread, remnants of someone's mourning. Um, and this next poem is the plate that appeared um, on the cover of my book. Um, and the the poem is called Ode to the Morning Dove, but um, the plate, the, the common name at the time um, was actually Carolina Dove, and they also referred to them as Turtle Doves. Um, so, Ode to the Morning Dove, and you can see why I kept the, um, the current name. Um, you'll, you'll see why at the end of the poem. How can we not love your nests, each twig an offering from male to female as he stands upon her back. Such economy, the way the heft of your bodies molds the sticks. Spare, we should say, not crude, not flimsy. Please forgive us for finding your tiny heads so comical above your plump, delicious breasts. But how we covet the blue rims lining your black eyes and your tranquil coloring amid summer's dazzle of emerald and ruby flight. We rest our eyes on the soft grays of your wings, the rosy buff of your chest. 
but mostly we adore the rattle of wind through your wings and how when dawn's chatter rises to cacophony, we can always discern your throat's pulse. Oh, dove, the sweet ache of your lament. Teach us to sing our grief. So um, this plate um, is one of my favorite plates in the book. And um, I think Joyce showed a slide of this earlier. Um, this is the first plate that appears in illustrations of the nests and eggs um, by, that was by Virginia. Um, and I'm, it kind of, my poem deals with um, the process of her preparing her first lithograph, which um, Joy described so well. And um, I was really um, interested to see that machine, which I didn't know about. Loggerhead Shrike. Nest, crayons, blank stone, all as her daughter left them on her drafting table, even the worktop's height. Loggerhead Shrike. Embarrassing how little the label means to her. Perhaps it's best, as she begins, not to see the small bird impaling its prey but to focus on the crook in the tree, branch, thorns, leaves, on the tangle of twigs and fibers, grasses and weeds. With each scrape of black wax, she learns what Genevieve knew, how to weave horsehair in weed stems, the fan of chicken feathers, curl of rootlets, the fine silk of milkweed. How to make an image shine back at her from stone. This next poem is um, about this plate, long long-billed marsharin, um, but it's actually um, a kind of a made-up study of the plate. So a few of the poems um, in the book, um, I kind of imagined preliminary sketches or studies, um, and this is one of those. Study for long-billed marsharin. Before she finds the crook and bend of marsh grass, Virginia sketches the mass of yarn and thread that squats like a tumor at the bottom of her sewing kit. A mystery how the skeins unspool themselves into snarls, but here she entwines the crimson grain from Genevieve's best dress with the indigo wool from her favorite gloves, as if weaving a spell for a daughter who loved to unpuzzle the tangles of remnants, whether silk or weed stem, velvet or vine. And um, now I'm going to go back and read um, the poem that was actually based on the drawing, um, long-billed marshren, or the, the plate, I'm sorry. Um, and this poem begins with an epigraph um, from the text of the book that was written by Howard Jones. And um, for many of these poems, I was just as inspired by um, the, the drawings as I was by the text, which had all kinds of interesting bird facts that I didn't know. And the epigraph reads, every ornithologist has noted the fact that but few nests of the whole number found contain eggs, and many guesses have been made to account for the construction of so many useless houses.
<clears throat> impossible while considering the intricate ribbons of grasses lashed to cattails, the feathers and plant down refining the interior, not to think of the other nests, unlined, emptier than husks, hidden like typhoid in marshes, small temples to promise unfulfilled. Um, this is uh, the nest of the blue jay, and um, the poem is called Ode to the Blue Jay, and uh, it also begins with an epigraph by Howard, and the epigraph reads, Notwithstanding the general meanness of the jay bird, some good things may be said of him. Can there be boldness without a tilt toward meanness? Even your appearance manifests daring. The blue crest that rises at the first slight, the line of black collar starched upon the gray breast, the black bars and white scallops banding blue wings. Braced against the scaled trunks of pines, festooned with thorns, only the nest's interior betrays any softness. Who can deny the audacity as you pilfer rootlets from our fresh graves? Take them, little bird. We need only dirt to line our final beds. Green Heron. First she draws the limb, branches stripped to gnarled joints. Then the pile of twigs, stark as November, and so brittle she can hear the snap. Virginia settles the familiar curves of eggs into the jumble and admires the lack of fibers and feathers knowing, as the birds do, that you may as well lay your babies down on a bed of bone. <clears throat> this is another ode. Um, is Ode to the Purple Martin. And um, this is, I think there's only a couple of plates in the whole book that actually show the bird in them. Um, and this is one of them. Darling Martin, dear Chunky Swallow, you never doubt our desire for you. Your stout neck, your feathers, gray, brown, or black, and glossed with violet. Pugnacious aerialist, we marvel at your nightly dance and bet on you against wren or hawk. You are happy to colonize whatever box we build for you, to bustle in columned mansions or worship in churches, to fulfill your civic duty in domed courthouses. The humblest gourds we hollow, winter-colored crooknecks, freckled as some other bird's eggs, ring with your chortles and croaks. Even here, on this yellowed print, you do not question our need for your face to shield us from the gourd's stark mouth.
this is another um, poem where I'm actually writing about, um, well, it's actually a, an imaginary sketch. Um, but this is the final plate, so I thought I would show it um, as I read. <clears throat> and it's Field Sketch for Meadowlark. In a field stained April green, her son pointed at the swirl of grass that signaled the nest. Virginia glimpsed the eggs glisten like wet stones. Abandoned, he said, which took the sting out of the mother's cries. He unstitched the green grass from brown to expose the nest's dome, a frame for tiny beaks to bloom like secrets, a window opening into first staggering flight. So um, Joy spoke at length about um, Howard and Virginia's illness. Um, and I did write a poem about um, Virginia's illness. Um, so this one is, again, not about a um, particular plate. Um, Carrie, Carrie, I, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, but could you talk a little bit louder? I, I see Dorina, I see Joy. I think we're all having maybe just be closer to your mic a little bit so we could hear you. Your your voice is very soft, sweetie. How is how is this? Is that any better? Is this better? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, it's that's better. <clears throat> Fever. The quilt Virginia huddles beneath is too blue, Delft blue, not sky. It is not her quilt, but it is her quilt. That window opens too wide. She's shivering. Someone shut it, please. It is not her window, but it is her window. And the girl leaning over her, a slender curving beak interrupts her face and chestnut down blooms like moss over her skin. She is and isn't Genevieve. Don't move, Virginia, don't startle her. Feel the kiss of her bill against your cheek. The feathers trimming her skirt silence its rustle. She cannot speak, Virginia, but maybe she will sing. I'm just going to read a couple more. Um, and this one is... Uh, called um, Golden Winged Warbler, and um, this is actually um, on a plate that has two um, nests on it. Um, but I just um, wanted to show you this particular one. Golden Winged Warbler. Virginia does not know this bird, nor wish to see the ghost of golden crown and wings alight on the nest. It's enough to picture the damp warmth of leaf litter, the birch leaf curled like a lid over eggs still lit from within. She reads the raised lines of petioles like braille translates ridges of grapevine into wax. Her fingers can barely detect the pinprick holes out of which the blush of yolk and albumen leaked. 
another blanched shell, while the mother's marks, wreaths of Van Dyke and Bister Flex, born of her blood, remain. And um, the last poem that I wanted to read is A Black-Capped Chickadee. Virginia eases the stump open along the seam, afraid the decaying wood might collapse upon its secret. Inside, even the heartwood crumbles. She sketches jagged, illegible rings, the half moon where the birds first tunneled, edges sharp as a bite. Her lines cramp near the tree's disintegrating core. Against the wood's striations, the nest appears in relief, a cloud of moss and down that holds its shape when released from the cavity's embrace. A tree's heart hardens and dies a little each day. How lucky, then, to have the dust replaced with bits of moss and fur to begin again with freckle-spattered eggs. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, um, Carrie. Those were some beautiful poems. Those were really, really in. We do. Um, I don't know whether to hold this till my end or if I should say it now. But I think I'm, I'm thinking of it now, so I'm going to say it to you uh, both. You, you women are inspirational. You have taken, taken things that were projects and, and, and put your heart and soul in it so that you can see for both of you um, that this is more than a project. It's like part of your life. Joy, just you uh, kind of tearing up when you're talking about the Jones family, it just was very interesting to me and very, I don't know, I don't know, inspiring that you would, you have allowed yourself to make this family story part of your own fabric and your own tapestry. Really, really magnificent. And Carrie, I don't know who your friend is, your, your, your librarian friend, but you should thank her from the bottom of your heart because you have created something by using someone else's, uh, the illustrations and Joy's book to create a wonderful book of poetry and brought back poems and made them concrete to us. They're not an abstract, uh, uh, ethereal kind of thing, but something that we all can relate to in, in what you're talking about, your grief with your father, uh, your, your poem about the morning dove, and yes, it was very, it, it was easy to see why you kept the current name, and, and just so many things. Um, I I just can't say more, but uh, with that, I'd like to open it uh, for people who may have questions, and uh, you can either put them um, in the chat, and I or Betsy, Betsy or I can uh, relate them, or we really kind of like people to ask their own questions. So, uh, Martha, uh, I would like to know if you might have a question for the authors uh, 
that you would like to uh, talk to them about. Uh, we're going to start with you since you're one of our new new people. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have um, a question for Joy. Um, just exactly what was your first contact point with the uh, work that got you inspired? And for Carrie, how did you decide of all of those uh, plates and photo, uh, you know, um, lithographs or whatever to choose to write about? I think you might mean that question for Carrie, because. The, the second question was for uh, Carrie Joy. The I'm first sorry. one, she wondered what what was your uh, first connection that made you want to write your book? Well, I think it was um, seeing that nest that I couldn't get to when I was six years old because I wasn't allowed to climb up where the Oreos were. <laughs> and... Uh, just the idea that I never knew any other little girl six years old that wanted to climb a tree or look at a bird's nest. And I just felt a kind of kinship to Genevieve. And when I when I started my job in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, I felt like the luckiest person on earth. And I felt like I've had so many opportunities in my lifetime and Genevieve didn't have any. And it just became my mission to to salvage her story, to help her family salvage her story. That's that's a very good answer, uh, Joy, and that I think says it in a nutshell. You know, and and that to me again is inspiring. That something that happened when you were six years old stayed with you. You come to Cleveland you look at this bird nest and you think, there it is. There's my Oriole bird nest. And that's, that's I think, a great answer. Um, Carrie, on to you. I think that's a good question as well. Martha's asking, um, what, why did you choose the plates you chose to write the poems? Yeah, that's it. It is a good question, and I don't know that I have, um, you know, I, it was a very, it was a long process and kind of a, a roundabout process. Um, so, you know, I would initially, I was just kind of go through and look at what um, the place that attracted me, you know, visually, um, and um, I worked with Joy's book, but I also worked with um, the digitized version of the um, of illustrations of the nests and eggs, um, which you know the full the full text um, is available um, online in a couple of different places. Um, in Joy's books, there's just some excerpts of Howard's text. Um, so I would read um, the full text by Howard. Um, so it was kind of a combination of being attracted to the images and being interested in the stories of the birds and the facts about the birds. Um, and, you know, sometimes it was just, it was also, I, I wrote about many more plates than actually made it into the book. So, um, you know, it was just seeing what, what came out of, um, what I discovered in writing about them. Okay. You, ladies. That was good. Appreciate it. It was. Okay. Thanks, Martha. Anything else? Or can I move on to the next person? No, that's that's the only questions I have. Thank you very much. I certainly have enjoyed this uh, session. It is. Isn't it great? Um, tell your friends about us, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, Pamela, 
Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. It's Carrie's mom. Uh, what do you think of the presentation tonight? Would you like to uh, give us your thoughts about your talented daughter and and <laughs> her mentor, Joy Kaiser? <laughs> I thought I thought it. Oh, we've lost you. I don't know what the problem is. Can anybody else hear Pamela? No, we can't. I'm sorry, Pam. We can't um can't hear you. I don't know. Oh, she just joined the meeting again. So let's hope. Oh, sorry. That's I don't okay. know. I always hit the wrong button. Okay. Uh, anyway, I very much, very much enjoyed it. I loved hearing Joy's um, background to the book. I knew that Carrie has been working on this for uh, years, and it's just wonderful to see that she has her book out. And I appreciate so much listening to the uh, broadcast tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for that. I think Pamela left us again, but I'm sure she'll be back. Um, Darina, I know that you always have a question for our author speakers, so I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. Well, one question is just I'm curious as to where Carrie lives. I actually, I live in Kentucky, um, okay. but I'm originally from Florida, um, oh. but uh, the, so that's where my mom and my aunt, <laughs> Martha Swaggerty, are, are in Florida, um, <laughs> uh, but it, it was really nice, um, you know, being in Kentucky, I, I did get a grant, um, I applied for a grant, um, from the Kentucky Foundation for Women, and it's a feminist arts organization here in Kentucky. And I, I was able to um, go to Circleville and um, drive up to um, Columbus, with the, where the Ohio Historical Society um, is, um, and um, do some research. Um, in Ohio and, and see, we actually, the University of Kentucky has an uncolored copy of um, illustrations of the nests and eggs. Um, so I, I went there first and looked at the um, uncolored copy. Um, and then I saw a couple of um, colored copies um, in Columbus. And also the Cincinnati Public Library has a copy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say too that um, for having both Joy here and you here, both of you bring this uh, very personal kind of way of looking at uh, the work of the family. And um, I really think that having your both of your perspectives helps to really give a lot of depth to to the original production and how really amazing this whole thing is and you're kind of giving it more life. And then just, uh, I so enjoyed the way you talked about how probably um, Genevieve, you know, really understood how the net nests were constructed. And, uh, and I had not really, you know, that wasn't in my my thoughts as I have looked through the book uh, in the past to, to think about, oh, she must have really, really understood that. And did she take it apart? And did she know everything, how these nests were constructed? And so you brought that out in your poetry. And uh, it's great having a poetic sensibility, I think, to this uh, to this book. And, and also both of you, I think, just uh, showed how like especially I guess for the parents of Genevieve you know like what this meant to them 
So the, the book is uh, taking on some new um, meaning for me, and um, I'm looking forward to perusing it um, much more um, lovingly, I guess. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Drina. That was that was a great, great synopsis of what this was. Um, well, wow, it's been almost an hour and a half long, which is is great. But you know, I was kind of at the edge of my seat for the whole thing, and it was really interesting. Um, and I look forward to next uh, weekend the 21st when Joy and Carrie are going to um, join us for our nature, uh, favorite books of nature. It will be very interesting. And ladies, I want to thank you again. I, As I said, um, to me, you are women authors that bring your heart and soul to your work. And, and it's good to see. I think we need more young women to uh, look at things this way with, um, like Drina said, love um, in a loving way. You both chose subjects that became more uh, than projects, and that's wonderful. Thank you both so much for coming, and thank you, Aunt Martha. And and Mama Pam for joining us too. And um, wait, I see your husband is here. Is Scott your husband? <laughs> oh, well, how about Scott? You want to give us your final words as to what you thought of the presentation tonight? Um, it would be great to end with you, I believe. Um, I'm waiting. <laughs> um, I, I also just wanted to say thank you for having me and thank you all for coming and um, it was a real treat for me too to get to hear Joy talk about um, the family and, and her research it was I think Scott's going to be shy for us so that's okay but that's Joy unusual, but <laughs> probably having a little bit more of technical problems still he can listen, but he's not sure how to talk yet. Okay. Well, you can teach him before next week. Okay. All right. Uh, Joy, again, that was really an interesting talk, and you gave us more of the background of the Jones family, which really um, adds to the presentation we had from you previously about uh, the other Audubon and um, I do hope that you and Betsy can work uh, something else so you, we can be on your schedule again for uh, 2021 and I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and um, we'll see you next week uh, 7 p.m. same time nice same place you, Carrie. bye 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 night everyone good night good night Night. Good night.